in case anybody has any quick comment they can do that but uh, let's go on to dr ms ravindra again uh, a very nice and a thorough gentleman uh, great uh, practitioner of uh, sics and also refractive surgery and uh, my uh, senior from rp center uh, over to you dr ravindra you will be talking about uh, hyperopia laser vision correction thanks uh, dr mahipal hope you can see my slide yes okay uh, my, uh, uh, I am always indebted to Dr. Ragni, Professor Lahane, and Dr. Pritham, Dr. Swapnesh, and all the office bearers of MOS and BOA for giving me this opportunity to be with the stars, luminaries of, of our country in the field of LASIK. Uh, I have uh, no financial interest, but I do use all the gadgets that I mentioned. Hyperopes, most of the LASIK surgeons are worried about hyperopes and worried about regression. This person is not going to be happy for some reason. But then uh, let, let me uh, share my experience and thoughts about how to be happy yourself and how to make the patients really happy with uh, hyperopic uh, uh, refraction. In my uh, opinion, hyperopes, especially when they are 30s and 40s, are much more happier than a myo uh, because uh, they would have gained not only distance vision but also near vision. As Dr. Kudlu said, cycloporegic refraction is a must, not only for hyperopes, for everybody. Be routinely check the binocular vision, especially if it is a hyperopic patient. Look at the amblyopic status. Look at the fovea. Is it a steady foveal fixation? Even if the vision is 6-6, six, six, you know, the uh, plus or minus, this is very important to check whether the foveal fixation is all right. And mesopic pupil size is important in all of them, especially in hyperopes, because you're going to have a larger uh, optical zones. Angle kappa is extremely important again, and the rest of it is similar to myopia. And, and we use uh, this platform which gives us the uh, ready-made software to treat plus six spherical, plus in addition to it, you can treat as much as plus six cylinders. This is the platform we have. And we have treated up to plus nine. I'll, I'll show you a couple of cases. And uh, I love ASA and uh, we have all these facilities, but to make it, those who are using alcohol to make it absolutely painless, I would suggest these tiny flaps in the edge of it, if you excise all of them at the end of the surgery, at the end of your LASIK, remove them so that the epithelium that's left behind is tight and nice, just like you do a transepithelial or epitome uh, removal, you will not, patient will not have pain. It's not the alcohol that's causing pain, but these little flaps which move under contact lens are the cause for pain and now we remove all these, trim them up and there's no pain even if you do it under this thing. What's the most important thing is uh, the cyclotorsion, which can be avoided by encouraging the patient to open both the eyes. Of course, cyclotorsion facilities are available, but then if you, you put a drape there and this eye is closed, drape is going to touch his lashes and he keeps on blinking and he tries to close the one eye. So that can be avoided by putting a shield and do the fixation of the eye. The face has to be parallel. All that has to be done before you drape because once you drape, you don't know what's the position. And after doing that, after doing that, do not move the, the uh, your uh, uh, movements. If there is a decentration, move the head and bring him back. So that way you're sure that the face is absolutely parallel to the face and in, in, in axis. Do not move the joystick after you have initially looked at it. This is one of the very important thing to find out that you're doing the proper centration. We do a thin flap technique. This is especially important because often the flap size is 9.5 in hyperopes because they are larger. And how much of downward pressure, see that's a microcurotome, you apply it downwards. And the classical teaching is you apply it too much, that if you apply too much pressure, more of cornea prolapses into the, uh, the, uh, the ring here and you're going to cut thick flaps. So you can have a uniplanar flaps even with this. The secret is just touch it 360 degrees, it touches the limbus and activate the, uh, pre the vacuum and then you will have a very th little amount of cornea prolapsing into it and you'll have a nice uniplanar flap even with the microkeratome. And uh, the next thing that is a must in hyper, this is the most important thing, there are a lot of anatomical uh, points on the cornea and uh, the laser can only see your pupil whatever the size of it, and it can start ablating around the center of the pupil. But is the center of pupil is the place where you have to ablate? I'll uh, tell you that's the hy typical hyperopic eye. All hyperopes, remember that they have pseudoexotropia. What does it mean? They're not using the pupil center. They're using a point nasal to pupil center to see the world. 
this is very important if you are ablating leaving the all the statistics all the criteria all the nomograms to the machine it will be treating eccentrically to the visual axis this is something which you will have to do to have excellent results in hyperopia because hyperopia is not correct in the center you are correct in the periphery and you will have an indirect effect on the center this is very important in hyperopes and all of them have look at this eye that is why, where the people the machine starts treating but that's a visual axis depending upon Parkinji one the closest to visual axis is Parkinji one image and you are supposed to ablate it around that and not this about 95 percent of all the patients have visual axis elsewhere than the pupil the very few people have it and uh, you can see this eye whatever calculations you make you'll have to actually assess it ask the patient to open both the eyes look at the green blinking light you can see here it's no more here that's a pupil size you're at that at that point of time you'll have to shift to the right side that's a plus x axis by about 200 microns as you assess here so this is the most important thing that is the ablation that's a cornea that's a visual axis that's a pupil left to machine it is going to treat there now you'll have to shift it up there to the left side to have a perfect the uh, results as you can see I shift that to this this can be done uh, in every machine has got a different way of doing it and uh, uh, see the uh, pentacam gives a rough estimate this is the distance between pupil center and vertex not the uh, this is not angle kappa but this is nearest to angle kappa 0.35 and uh, minus and they are this is important minus and plus what does this minus and plus do Yeah, this is how you see the right eye and left eye. I mean, when you are looking at it, forget about the patient is lying down, forget about which eye is it. Any movement from the center to the right side is an X plus. Any movement to the left side is an X minus. Any movement towards you, you are sitting here, is a Y minus. Any movement up towards the patient's leg is Y, whether it's right eye and left eye. So minus 0.35 means it's on the X axis. You'll have to shift the fixation, the, uh, the visual axis pointer to the left side by 350 mic microns and you'll have to shift y-axis uh, downwards here by uh, 190 microns this is in millimeters so this is a must in hyperopes and after doing that this is again uh, again the patient has to blink and look at the green light all along and uh, you do the center test the center test confirms that the center of ablation comes from the center of pupil and rests on this. So confirm it by doing the center test on the machine. And uh, that's what you have to, this machine says uh, X axis plus 1.7 for that. So you have to shift the centration to the right side. It's on a plus side to the right side. And uh, uh, 150 microns is what I have taken. And then you start ablating. Then you'll have a perfect, very good results. And uh, you know that the optical zone that we're going to keep in hyperopes is larger. It's not 5.5 and 6. Generally, I keep 7 millimeters. And then there's a blending zone. So total ablation becomes about 9 millimeters. So we'll have to have routinely a 9.5 millimeter flap. And if you're going to treat that, you mean that you're, this is a flap that you kept that. If you're going to treat this, hyperopic ablation is in the periphery. That's going to hit the corneal flap. So if you do not protect the corneal flap there will be an ablation here there will be an ablation here post operatively he'll have a gutter like thing because there is a double double ablation here what you should do is you have to protect the flap on this side so that the laser doesn't hit on this side the what i do is routinely looking at the parameters the flap making itself i decenter towards the nasal side this i routinely do it about half millimeter or even one millimeter so the flap itself is decentered towards the nasal side so to protect the hinge and you will have maximum ablation on this side so imagine if you're going to protect with uh, the uh, the uh, this hinge that means this area that area is not ablated at all so shift the flap itself i create a large and eccentric flap depending upon the size of the cornea and that will serve a lot of uh, the flap itself is moved that side. So uh, let me go fast. And uh, again, the machine can say something. The, the pentacam can say there is a decentration of 0 0.51 in the right eye and in the right eye here, 
from the people center but actually you will have to reassess the amount of uh, uh, the uh, decentration you will have to do actually on the table that can be done every mission has got the facilities and uh, the next one is you are going to tell the patient to look at the green light continuously throughout the surgery tracker is there but if the patient is moving his eye left and right and up and down and the centration will not be proper so uh, we in the last 200 eyes, we did 188, we did the decentration like this. It can be small, y axis 20 and 160. This is not dependent upon the pentacam results, this is dependent upon the, uh, the actual measurements that you do on the table. Only 12 eyes did not need a decentration. And uh, imagine you have patient with that kind of power, all the parameters are applicable. You have a 7.75, 2.5. How do we manage it? If other parameters are good enough and uh, look at the, how much will be the uh, corneal steep, steepness at the end of procedure, what we do is we correct plus six and full astigmatism in mean first go. And treatment two is also fed into the machine and residual hyperopia, that's 1.75. I'll treat it again in the same sitting. K readings and PACI for the second treatment has to be modified because after the first treatment, both the K reading and the PACI would have changed and you'll have to refocus the corneal surface for the second and uh, presumed post first treatment values are entered in the second treatment. Optic zone, ablation zone and same amount of decentration is done for the second treatment also. As you can see here, these are the parameters. Optical zone, I've kept it at 650. Decentration is 300 microns on to my left side, 100 microns towards me, the surgeon. So that's the second treatment uh, parameters and first treatment parameters. And we have done uh, many cases using these parameters with excellent results. And it is possible to treat more than what the machine uh, offers us uh, in some special situations. How much of K? It is not one adapter treating, corrects one adapter of K reading. We have calculated that one adapter of uh, correction of the uh, you know, the refractive error in the hyperopic zone corrects about 0 0.6 adapters. So when you modify the K-reading for second treatment, that's the data you'll have to use. So that's the result of double uh, uh, LASIK treatment in the same sitting. Every person is not, uh, you know, fit for it, but you'll have to have a flat cornea, you'll have to have a normal size, thickness. The hyperopic doesn't treat the center, it treats the periphery. So you're all right about central corneal thickness. The uh, press basic, uh, Dr. Kudlu has covered it. I'll not cover uh, much of it. I'll use the FCAT program that's in our, uh, this thing. The, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to change the uh, A sphericity from pre existing 0 0.31 to minus 1. Minus 1 A sphericity will give an extended uh, depth of field. We use ACIS sphere adjustment nomogram to custom uh, Q value. We can also do, uh, this is what is the uh, uh, Q target, target. So the patients are extremely happy. We have done uh, uh, monovision treatment also. The dominant eye is done for distance and the non-dominant eye, we have corrected the presbylasic. They are also, the, we'll have to talk to the patient counseling is very important. See here, the uh, right eye prelasic, the patient had a Q value of 0 0.15 on the minus side. It became minus one post-operatively with very good uh, near vision. And the other eye is uh, optimized treatment where the Q value was not adjusted. He has very good distance vision in that. So uh, we did about, uh, I analyzed about 76 uh, consecutive eyes, uh, no intraoperative or postoperative or long term uh, complications. And this is the most important thing I'd like to do. If you've done a cycloplegic refraction, if you've done the calculations well, and, the, and if you've kept the optic zone larger, uh, the regression is almost nil. We had no regression in last 27 cases and uh, 41 high probes with presbyopia were treated by this technique out of uh, so many eyes. That's average Q value preoperatively and postoperatively and we use 58 microcritomes, 13 uh, fem2 and 4 of them were ASA and one was trans epithelial uh, treatment with ASA. Uh, so decentration was done in law, a large amount of uh, patients. In hyperopia, every patient had decentrations. One of them had a decentration of 1,250 microns. That's 1.25 microns was the decentration needed in one of the eyes. And uh, optic zone was uh, 7 millimeters. Some of them were 6 millimeters. 
and uh, vision after four years. There is no regression. Four years follow up was the longest follow up. It was one of the one of the patient, and uh, this patient had the six six N six vision even after four years. That is surface ablation. Surface ablation is talked uh, not much these days with the various facilities. So this is a person four years post op, absolutely clear cornea and vision is great. And uh, even on density uh, tometry on this haze evaluation, there is hardly any haze in these patients. So, uh, hypropic LVC is extremely good. Uh, these are the points I would like to stress upon again. Do a good cyclopegic refraction. It does not matter even if you give some my myopic correction in the median post op, but do not undercorrect these people. Otherwise, they will come back again. Large decenter flaps are important and it, it corrects a lot of them. Thin flap technique is uh, I use it because then I, uh, you know, uh, we have to have a large flaps. Optical zones have to be larger to minimize the uh, aberrations. Angle kappa management is one of the most important thing that we have. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ravindra. Uh,